All right. Hi, everyone. This is Janice Yee, Director of Advancements for the California Budget and Policy Center. Thank you for joining the over 320 of you who have registered for our webinar today for a briefing on the governor's May revision of the proposed 2019-20 state budget. This webinar is part of our Policy Perspective Speaker Series, a year-round free event series that includes webinars and in-person events throughout the state. Policy Perspectives wouldn't be possible with the support of our sponsors for 2019, First 5 LA, and the Subsidy Foundation. Sorry about that. Today's briefing will discuss the May revision of the 2019-20 state proposed state budget. This webinar will feature the Budget Center team discussing major components of the governor's revised budget and their implications for low and middle income Californians. For our complete analysis, you can click on the link provided in the chat function of the webinar panel, as well as download the PDF on the resources tab. This is all can be found on our, on our website, calbudgetcenter.org. We do have a lot to get through today, so feel free to send us your questions throughout the webinar in the questions panel of GoToWebinar, or you can tweet us using hashtag policy perspectives. With that, I'm gonna start things off with Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Haney, the Executive Director of the Budget Center. Thank you for being with us here today, Janice. Thanks for kicking things off. Uh, the Budget Center's first look analysis of the May revision uh, is going to, it covers a whole set of changes and key points in the revision. And because of how much we're going to try to cover today, uh, we won't necessarily cover all of those proposals that were in the January proposal and that are continued in the May revision. We're going to try to focus on where there were changes. Um, since January, although we will cover some of it, and of course you're welcome to ask us questions if we don't cover something you uh, want some clarification about in terms of uh, if it had changed from January. Uh, and I'm, so I'm going to start us off today by talking about the reserves and paying down debts part of the budget. Um, I think it's important to remember that while a lot of the attention uh, at this, this time of the year often goes to those program uh, investments and expansions, and we're going to spend a fair bit of time on those here, that Governor Newsom, much like his predecessor, Governor Brown, is putting away some significant amounts of revenue um, into the state's reserves and into paying down debts and liabilities. Uh, and so uh, you can see this in a chart that we had in our January proposal um, and that we will be updating sometime soon as we get the numbers in. But in January, there was about $20 billion in discretionary funds uh, that were available um, for the legislature and the governor to allocate. And nearly half of those dollars were actually allocated to paying down debts and liabilities. Uh, about 12 or 13% were actually put into reserves. About a quarter or 25% of those funds were put into one-time investments in programs and services. And then the remaining 13% uh, or about that uh, went into actually ongoing commitments. So the kinds of program commitments that continue into future years. So all of that is just to say, if you think about the emphasis of that, a significant share of the discretionary dollars available goes to paying down debts and reserves, and that continues in the May revision. Uh, a few things to highlight in both categories. On the reserves side, the state's main reserve fund is something called the Budget Stabilization Account. It was established, or changed, I should say, in 2014 by voters when they passed Proposition 2, and it requires the state to set aside 1.5% of its general fund budget each year and some additional capital gains tax revenues during periods when the economy is really strong and those revenues are coming in at high levels. Uh, for this May revision, the total dollar amount into the budget stabilization account would be $2.2 billion. And by the close of the next fiscal year, that would mean that account grows to having about $16.5 billion in it. There's also a new reserve fund um, that was established by Proposition 2 that goes for K through 12 schools, uh, requires funds to be deposited into that reserve when certain conditions are met. Those conditions tend to be during periods of sustained economic growth like we're in now. We haven't had to make a deposit as a state into this reserve fund since it was created. The May revision actually calls for the first deposit into that fund of $389 million. This is also a proposal that wasn't in the January budget. Um, there's also another rainy day fund. This year's budget agreement um, for 2018-19 established a new safety net reserve fund that puts dollars aside to protect CalWORKs and Medi-Cal during periods of economic downturn. This year's budget put $200 million into that fund for the first time. 
uh, Governor Newsom's may revise, much like his January proposal calls for $900 million more, I'm sorry, $700 million more to go to that fund, uh, building it up to 900 million. And lastly, there's a special fund for economic uncertainties that would have $1.6 billion in the governor's May revision. And if you add up all of those funds, uh, basically where you get to uh, is but by the end of 2019-20, there's over $19 billion set aside in reserves. On the debt side, the May revision continues to include required and supplemental contributions to the state's two largest retirement systems, the uh, CalPERS, the, the Public Employees Retirement System, and CalSTRS, the Teachers Retirement System. Uh, beyond the required uh, contributions, the governor's revised, revised budget makes two major supplemental contributions. The first is, uh, like his January proposal, he continues to call for a $3 billion supplemental payment to CalPERS. Uh, and in addition, the May revise includes a one-time $3.2 billion payment to CalSTRS, this is slightly higher than it was in January when it was $3 billion. Um, this is a, a payment on behalf of local educational agencies and community colleges to CalSTRS uh, that helps reduce some fiscal pressures on uh, local educational agencies in particular uh, because of some reworking of the CalSTRS formula and the shares that each set of actors pay. This reduces some of the pressures on the teacher's retirement system that the local schools have been, have been facing and they've been a part of some of the um, local fiscal crises that we've been dealing with around the state. Uh, and then lastly, as with the January proposal, the governor's uh, May revision would pay off all the remaining debts that were still on the books from the Great Recession. Uh, so that does it for the debts and liabilities and reserves. I'm gonna now turn it over to my colleague, uh, policy analyst Kayla Kitson, who will talk about the revenue picture and uh, how that underlies these decisions about reserves, debts, and liabilities, and ongoing investments. Thanks, Chris. So the revenue outlook in the May revision reflects continued but slowing economic and revenue growth in the three-year budget window, which covers fiscal years 17-18 through 19-20. The revised budget assumes that uh, general fund revenues will be about $3.2 billion higher than what was projected in the January budget proposal. Um, personal income tax revenues are expected to be higher, primarily due to anticipated higher anticipated capital gains from a strong stock market, as well as the surge in IPOs from California-based companies this year. Corporate tax revenues are also expected to be higher, but this is primarily uh, reflects timing shifts and one-time payments related to the new federal tax law. The projection for sales and use tax revenues is lower than in the January budget, which is mainly due to weaker than expected capital investment by businesses. Uh, the May revision also includes some tax policy proposals that affect the revenue outlook. The revised budget maintains the January proposal to adopt specific provisions of the new federal tax law in order to pay for an expanded earned income tax credit, which you'll hear more about shortly. This so-called conformity package would raise an estimated $1.4 billion annually on net and would mainly affect corporations and other businesses. The governor also um, continues to propose that the state provide tax incentives for investments in economically distressed census tracts designated as opportunity zones. And that's on top of the federal tax incentives that are already available. Unlike the federal incentives though, the state incentives would only be available for investments in for affordable housing and green infrastructure or green technology. Finally, the May revision contains a new proposal to exempt diapers and menstrual products from the sales tax for two years, which would result in some revenue losses to the state general fund, as well as to local governments. Now I'll go ahead and hand it over to senior policy analyst, Alyssa Anderson, to talk more about the proposed earned income tax credit expansion. Okay, thanks Kayla. So the California Earned Income Tax Credit is a refundable state credit that helps people who earn very little from their jobs to pay for necessities like food and utilities. Um, in January, the governor proposed expanding the credit to more people, increasing the size of the credit, and also providing an additional $500 to families with kids uh, under age six. The May revision proposes to double this credit for families with young kids from $500 to $1,000. Um, with this change, the administration estimates that the total cost of the Cali ITC will be about $1.2 billion. That's up from what's estimated to be uh, a credit that costs about $400 million this year. 
Um, and as Kayla mentioned, the governor is proposing to offset the full cost of the expanded Cal AITC by conforming to several federal tax law provisions, mainly affecting business income. Um, in fact, he said that the expansion of the Cal AITC is contingent upon making these changes in California tax code. Uh, and just to clarify, California has the ability to decide on a case-by-case -case basis which provisions of federal tax law to conform to or to adopt as part of the state's tax code. And so policymakers can choose which provisions they think are sound tax policy and which would benefit the state. Uh, as Kayla mentioned, the administration estimates that their conformity package would increase state revenue by about $1.4 billion per year. Um, and because this proposal would raise revenue by increasing state taxes, uh, again, mostly on corporations and other businesses, it would require a two-thirds vote of both houses uh, of the legislature. Um, one other Cal ATC related change that I want to flag in the May revision is a proposal to provide almost $20 million to the Franchise Tax Board to develop and administer a program um, that would allow people to receive some of their Cal ATC as advanced monthly payments. Um, and the idea here is to let people receive some of their credit monthly to better align with the timing of their expenses, which typically are paid monthly. One notable absence in the May revision is that the governor is not proposing to extend the Cali ITC to immigrant families who are currently excluded from the credit. So currently tax filers and all of the children they claim have to have social security numbers valid for work in order to qualify for the Cali ITC. And because of this rule, many Californians and many California children uh, who have immigrant parents, including US born children, can't benefit from the credit at all. Um, and this rule also means that families who uh, families could lose access to the credit if they lose immigration relief, such as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Revivals, or Temporary Protected Status, due to anti-immigrant actions taken by the federal government. Uh, but California could change this rule and allow tax filers to claim the Cali ITC using individual taxpayer identification numbers or ITINs, which the federal government provides to people with the specific purpose of paying taxes. Um, this would allow hundreds of thousands of additional children to benefit from the Cali ITC at relatively little cost to the state. Um, and I wanted to highlight that we're going to have more information coming out um, actually any minute now. Uh, on this issue. We're publishing an analysis um, this morning, so watch for an email from us. Um, and I also wanted to point out that Assembly Sub 4 will be hearing these issues today at 1.30. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Essie uh, to talk about CalWORKS. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, so as Alyssa mentioned, I'm going to start off by discussing the governor's proposal regarding CalWORKS grants uh, and then move on to, to some other items. So um, if we could uh, pull up the slide, uh, CalWORKS is the uh, state's cash assistance program, uh, which serves uh, low-income children while helping families uh, overcome barriers to employment and, uh, and find jobs. Monthly grants are adjusted according to the number of people in the household who are eligible for CalWORKS, and that's also known as the assistance unit. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, last year, the state, in last year's uh, uh, budget, the state sought to raise CalWORKS grants, um, which was much needed uh, because the annualized maximum CalWORKS grant for a family of three has actually been well below the deep poverty threshold, which is defined as 50% of the federal poverty line for over a decade. So seeking to solve this problem, the state proposed uh, setting a goal to eventually, over the course of three years, uh, raise the maximum grant to the deep poverty threshold uh, for all CalWORKS families. Uh, and they started with a, an across the board 10% increase to the grant, um, which took effect this past April 1st, with the next two steps uh, still remaining uh, unfunded. Uh, in, next slide. Uh, in January, the governor actually presented his own plan, which remains uh, unchanged in the main revision. Um, his proposal would be to raise CalWORKS grants um, directly to the 50% of the federal poverty line, but only for some families. Uh, so the next slide, uh, you can see that he proposes an additional 13.1% uh, increase uh, starting October 1st. Um, that would be on top of the 10% increase provided for uh, in, starting April 1st. Uh, and that would cost out to about 340, uh, 348 uh, million out of the general fund. 
Uh, but it's important to note uh, that this increase um, would actually only raise grants to 50% of the federal poverty line for some CalWORKs families. So if you go to the next slide, if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that if you take a three person uh, family um, in which every member of the family is eligible for CalWORKs uh, cash assistance, then yes, the governor's proposal does indeed uh, raise that household, uh, raise grants for that household to 50% of the federal poverty line. However, uh, in more than half of all CalWORKs cases, at least one family member is ineligible actually for cash assistance, even though all members of the family uh, share resources. So because the administration's proposed budget doesn't provide funding for those households with ineligible family members, uh, children in all households um, where, where they're sharing resources with ineligible members, again, that's about 55% of all CalWORKs cases, um, those children would still uh, be living in deep poverty. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. So in, thank you. In January, the governor also proposed um, various investments in infant and maternal uh, well-being, uh, particularly through home visiting services that in the mayor vision uh, he maintains uh, and, and increases. So for the CalWORKs home visiting initiative, which uh, was kicked off uh, this past January 1st, uh, the governor allocates uh, a little over 89 million in federal TANF and state general fund dollars um, to that uh, home visiting initiative. Uh, and a little over 10 million uh, of that is added since the January proposal um, due to uh, increased caseload projections. And then also uh, the, in the mayor vision provides for 65 uh, million total to the black infant health program and also to home visiting programs that are outside of the CalWORKs program. Uh, 30.5 million uh, in general fund of that 65 total was actually already proposed in January. Uh, and the additional 23 million for home visiting and 12 million for the Black Infant Health Program uh, comes from uh, Medicaid uh, reimbursements for Medicaid eligible activities uh, within that space. And then lastly, if we go on to the, the last slide, uh, we also want to highlight that while it's true that the governor did propose investments uh, in our communities for children uh, and families, there are still other aspects um, of economic security uh, in our families that he overlooked. So specifically, we're talking about uh, SSI, SSP grants. The Governor Newsom provides no increase um, for SSI SP, SSP grants, uh, which help over 1 million low-income seniors and people with disabilities in our state uh, pay for housing and other necessities. And except for a discretionary cost of living adjustment that occurred uh, January 2017, the state portion of, uh, of the, those grants has not been restored since policymakers made rather deep cuts to it uh, following the Great Recession. So that's something that an aspect of economic security that we did want to highlight is not um, really moving forward uh, according to the governor's proposal for 2019-20. And on that note, uh, that sort of ends it for me. So I'm going to hand things over to Sarah and she's going to talk about uh, housing and, and homelessness. Great, thank you, Essie. Um... So as we all know, um, California's housing affordability crisis is really serious, one of the greatest challenges facing the state. Uh, more than half of California renter households pay more than 30% of their income toward rent. Um, it's a key driver of our high poverty rate. Um, and the folks who are most impacted by the housing affordability crisis are the lowest income households who are renting. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the proposals included in the May revision related to housing and also related to homelessness um, as the sort of two areas uh, where we see the impacts of the housing affordability crisis. Um, so first about housing, um, there's really not a lot of big changes in the May revision. Um, the governor's revision generally maintains the proposed state investment in housing production that was included in the January budget. Um, proposal with some modification of the funding allocations and some minor increases in spending. So um, some of the proposals relate to local housing production goals and local accountability for meeting housing production goals. Um, the key change included in the May revision is that, um, so in January, the administration proposed 
uh, $750 million one-time general fund dollars to support local planning and incentives for housing production. Of that $750 million, $500 million was to be awarded as um, incentives for local jurisdictions to meet housing production milestones, um, and it could would be available for general purposes. The May revision um, reallocates that $500 million um, instead to the Infill Infrastructure Grant Program administered by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, and that grant program provides grants to fund infrastructure that's needed um, to support the development of higher density and mixed income housing in infill locations. Um, so that was the, the major reallocation of housing funds included in the May revision. Um, the May revision also maintains the governor's January proposal to link local transportation funding to whether or not housing local governments are meeting their housing production goals. Um, and so with some more specific details this time, so specifically the administration proposes that the transportation funds available through the gas tax or Senate Bill 1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, um, the revision proposes that those dollars be distributed to local jurisdictions upon compliance with housing element law and zoning and entitling to meet updated housing goals. Um, in terms of, of state dollars more um, broadly available to support affordable housing production, um, the governor maintains the, the boost that he proposed in January of $500 million in tax expenditures for the low income housing tax credit program. Um, so no additional state expenditures proposed there. Um, it also maintains the January budget's increased commitment to supporting mixed income housing through both tax credits through the low income housing tax credit program and through loans. Um, one change, however, is that um, to support preservation and rehabilitation of existing affordable housing units, which is an important component of making sure that we don't lose housing that's affordable now, um, the May revision includes a new proposal to modify the existing um, uh, low-income housing tax credit program. Um, so the not the new $500, not the new $500 million um, in in tax expenditures proposed, but the existing program um, to allow for deeper subsidies for specified preservation projects. Um, but there's no proposed increase in the overall um, tax expenditures for these uh, for the low-income housing tax credits for this purpose. Um, some additional proposals relate to the use of excess state property and cap and trade proceeds. So um, in the January proposal, the governor um, proposed um, making state, uh, making excess state property available for development for affordable housing and mixed income housing demonstration projects. And the May revision includes a little bit of funding and some, um, some staff positions to move forward with implementing that proposal. Um, and in addition, uh, funding through cap and trade auction proceeds, uh, some of that funding is available to support housing production through the Transformative Climate Communities Program. Um, and the May revision notes that the cap and trade proceeds are higher than had been originally anticipated and proposes allocating, um, the January proposal proposed $40 million for the Transformative Climate Communities Program. And the May revision, um, proposes allocating an additional 92 million one time, so bringing the total to $132 million available for that program. Um, one last proposal related to housing is that the May revision proposes um, allocating $20 million in one-time funds to support legal aid for renters um, to help them resolve landlord-tenant disputes, and that would be distributed through the ju Judicial Branch's Equal Access Fund. Um, so overall, I think, um, as we noted in January, it's it's a really refreshing change that this administration sees a significant role for the state in addressing California's housing affordability crisis. Um, that wasn't generally the view of the last administration, so that is refreshing. Um, not much has changed since the January proposal related to housing production. Um, I think many stakeholders in the housing field who focus on low and moderate income Californians would say that there is room for the administration to do more to specifically target state support for housing production to the households who are most severely affected by housing affordability, which is the lowest income households uh, who are renting. Um, so turning next to homelessness, um, which is really sort of the extreme outcome of the housing affordability crisis, um, the May revision pro proposes some additional funding to, to address homelessness above and beyond what was uh, proposed in the January budget. Um, and it's important to note this is a very serious problem in California. We have nearly 25% of the uh, national population of homeless individuals in our state. 
Um, so uh, the revised budget from for, from um, the revised budget includes uh, some increases in funding for some specific proposals that address homelessness. Um, so in January, the administration proposed allocating $500 million in one-time general fund dollars to local jurisdictions to support emergency aid um, homelessness programs. And the May revision um, provides a, a modest increase in funding, so increases that from $500 million to a total of $650 million, um, and offers local jurisdictions more flexibility in how to spend those dollars. So the January proposal divided these funds between um, $300 million for activities directly related to emergency shelters or navigation center uh, development, and then $200 million as um, incentive funds for general purposes. Um, but the May revision doesn't make that distinction, just pools all of those dollars together for local jurisdictions to use. Um, and the, the May revision also expands the eligible uses for, for those funds so that um, the funds could be used in addition for things like hotel motel conversions, permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, and even jobs programs. Um, and generally, I think um, seeing that those uses expanded beyond just emergency shelter to include more housing first approaches and longer term solutions um, is a change that I think um, many, many uh, individuals working in the, in the homelessness field would welcome. Um, the May revision also specifies how these funds would be allocated among jurisdictions. So $275 million would be allocated to the 13 most populous cities, $275 million to the counties, and $100 million for continuums of care. Um, other increases in funding for homelessness include a $20 million augmentation to, um, uh, from the Mental Health Services Fund for counties that do not currently operate whole person care pilot programs. So that increases the total funding um, proposed to the whole person care pilots up to $120 million. So that increase will allow counties that um, don't currently have these pilots to provide coordinated health, behavioral health, and social services, including housing, for individuals prioritizing individuals with mental illness who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, and there's also some additional funding for um, to address homelessness and housing insecurity among college students. So $10 million in new ongoing general funds for students at the California State University at, uh, to meet the needs of students at the California State University and University of California. Um, so with all of these additions, the administration notes that overall state funding to address homelessness will total $1 billion more than the amount dedicated to homelessness in the current state budget. And I just would note that that billion dollar increase includes um, it's not a billion dollars more uh, in addition in the May revision, but it's a billion dollars total for all the all the programs um, from the January proposal and the new funding in the May revision, um, specifically related to housing and mental health services for homeless individuals, um, as well as some additional spending proposed in the May revision to address staffing in the public mental health system and to provide legal aid for renters. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Kristen. Hey, Sarah, I'm just going to interrupt really quickly. I just wanted to remind the audience that um, to please fill out your questions in the questionnaire. We will get to them during Q&A. Um, also, if you have specific questions on um, numbers or anything like that, you can also refer to the link that is sent in our chat function that has the link to the analysis and the slide deck. With that, Kristen, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Janice. So today I'm going to talk about paid family leave, I'm going to talk about subsidized childcare, and I'm also going to talk about early learning here in California. So in January, the governor committed to expanding California's paid family leave program from six weeks to six months in future years. The first step of this process was to be a, the establishment of a task force to um, best study and provide recommendations on how to move forward to expand our paid family leave program. The good news in the May revision is that in addition to establishing the task force, the governor is also proposing to expand our paid family leave program from six weeks to eight weeks in effective July 1, 2020. This is great news. The paid family leave program has been in existence since 2004, and um, for the past 15 years, the duration of leave has always just been six weeks. This is great news. In re regards to subsidized child care, the January proposal included $490 million one-time funding for subsidized child care infrastructure, which was defined by the administration as both um, facilities and then also workforce development. 
The May revision maintains funding for childcare infrastructure, but then also provides additional funding for subsidized childcare. So specifically, the May revision provides 80.5 million in Proposition 64 cannabis, cannabis funds to provide additional spaces specifically for school-aged children, and these slots will be added to the alternative payment program. The May revision also provides 40.7 million general fund to make an adjustment in the duration of CalWORK Stage 1 childcare. Um, our subsidized childcare and development system is comprised of CalWORKs and non-CalWORKs childcare. CalWORKs childcare is divided into three stages, and so this change applies to that first stage of CalWORKs childcare. And then finally, the May revision also provides 12.8 million in federal funds for a pilot program for emergency child care for um, families in crisis. There are a couple of notable exclusions from investments in subsidized child care. Specifically, um, the California Department of Education released our most recent regional market rate survey, the 2018 regional market rate survey, just came out a couple months ago. And there is no provision in the May revision to update rates for child care providers to reflect the new survey. Additionally, we also aren't seeing additional spaces for kids regardless of their age. And we know that only one out of nine kids in California that are eligible for subsidized child care and development programs receive services from a program that can serve them for a full day and throughout the year. And so additional spaces is incredibly important for low-income families in California. Turning to early learning, the governor's proposal in January made a commitment to expand the California State Preschool Program in future years. And this was to begin in this fiscal year with 10,000 slots, with 20,000 additional slots to be added in future years. So the May revision, maintain, the May revision maintains these 10,000 slots, but then postpones the start date from July 1, 2019 to April 1, 2020, which reduces the cost in our next fiscal year by about 93 million. So for a total cost in the budget year of about um, 32 million. The administration has also indicated in their budget summary that the additional 20,000 slots in future years will be dependent upon economic conditions and are not guaranteed. Finally, the January proposal provided 750 million in facility grants for full day kindergarten. The May revision scales back this amount to 600 million, but also better targets the funding to schools that will be converting from part day to full day programs. At this point, I'll um, hand it over to Jonathan Kaplan, Senior Policy Analyst, who will be talking about Proposition 98 and funding for our schools. Thanks, Kristen. So I'm going to be talking to you, as Kristen mentioned, about Proposition 98 and K-12 school funding this morning. To remind you, Proposition 98 is a mi annual minimum funding guarantee for K-12 schools and community colleges that is determined by a variety of factors uh, that often includes general estimates of general fund revenues. And Prop 98 funding levels in the May revision reflect adjustments to, due to changes in general fund revenue estimates from those made in January and other assumptions that affect the minimum guarantee. Based on those estimates and assumptions, the Proposition 98 funding level in the May revision is increased by about $750 million over the three-year budget window. That's 2017-18 through 2019-20. And it assumes a 2019-20 Proposition 98 funding level of $81.1 billion. That's about $390 million above, the, uh, above what was assumed or proposed in January. However, while economic conditions have boosted the 2019-20 Proposition 98 funding level, the entire $390 million increase above the level assumed in January must be deposited into the state's rainy day fund for K-12 schools and community colleges. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, this would be the first ever deposit into the so-called public school stabilization, public school system stabilization account, which is a constitutional provision that voters approved as part of Proposition 2, that's the new November 2014 ballot measure that also created the state's better known rainy day fund called the budget stabilization account that Chris also spoke about earlier. Now, deposits into the rainy day fund for K-12 schools and community colleges only occur under relatively strong fiscal circumstances and are intended to help school districts and community colleges weather economic circumstances when they're more challenging. 
In addition to the K-14 education rainy day fund provisions in the state constitution, there are also statutory provisions that's not in the constitution that would cap the amount of reserves a local school district could maintain in years after the K-14 education rainy day fund reaches a certain threshold. But the projected 2019-20 deposit into the rainy day fund for schools and community colleges falls far short of that threshold. And that means that there won't be a cap on school district reserves in 2020-2021. Now, due to the deposit into the state's rainy day fund for schools and community colleges and other increases in baseline costs, such as higher than expected attendance at schools, um, the state has discretion over, over roughly $150 million of the $750 million increase in Proposition 98 that's reflected in the May revision. The governor proposes to use a large majority of that funding, $120 million of the $150 million in discretionary resources to increase spending on special education grants to school districts that have high shares of students with disabilities and students that, that are otherwise disadvantaged. Now that would raise the overall level of funding for these special education grants to roughly $700 million, and the governor makes this funding ongoing as opposed to his January budget proposal, which included one-time funding as a part of those special education grants. So that's it for K-12 schools. I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Rose, who's gonna be talking to us about higher education uh, and, and other items, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, so I'm going to be covering the community colleges, the California State University, and the University of California. So for the community colleges, the May revise maintains commitments made in the January proposal with a few minor adjustments to the Promise Program and the new funding formula. Specifically, the revised budget increases the cost estimate for expanding the Promise Program. In January, the governor's budget proposal proposed increasing funding for the Promise Program by $40 million, which would be the amount needed to extend the program to a second year of tuition-free college for all full-time, first-time students. The May Revise provides an additional $5.2 million, which is just the updated estimate of how much that program would cost. Last year's budget also created a new funding formula for general purpose apportionments for the community colleges. The May Revise notes that the governor remains committed to this new funding formula and will work with the chancellor's office and stakeholders to continue to move forward with implementing the new formula and making adjustments as they see needed. It also extends the hold harmless provision by a year so districts will receive the same level of funding as they did in 2017-18 every year until 2021-22. And then for the CSU and the UC, in January, the governor proposed increasing funding for the UC and the CSU with the expectation that both institutions would not raise tuition. Earlier this year, both the UC Regents and the CSU Board of Trustees upheld the governor's expectation and voted to not increase tuition. So this is good news for students and good news for the institutions who will see increased funding. At the CSU, the May Revise maintains an increase of $300 million in ongoing funding. For context, the CSU is requesting a $554 million increase, so the governor is about $250 million short of the CSU's request. But the May Revise does add some additional funding for the CSU. It significantly increases funding for Project Rebound, which supports formerly incarcerated individuals seeking a college degree. In January, the budget allocated 250,000 ongoing funding per year, and the May Revise increases that to 1 million per year in ongoing funding. The May Revise also provides 740,000 one-time general fund for a first star foster youth program at California State University, Sacramento. And this is a program that supports foster youth with academic and life skills needed to successfully transition into higher education. At the UC, the May Revise also maintains the January proposal to increase funding by $240 million. For context, the UC is requesting an increase of about $380 million, uh, so that's $140 million higher than the governor's proposal. And then lastly, uh, uh, the governor's budget provides support for food and housing insecure students at both the UC and the CSU. This is $15 million in one-time funding for the CSU and 15 million in ongoing funding at the UC. And the budget also provides specific 
funding for rapid rehousing of housing of homeless and housing insecure students, 3.5 million at the CSU and 6.5 million at the UC. Notably, no such funding is proposed for the community colleges, which serves the largest number of low-income students. So that's it for uh, the community colleges, the UC and the CSU. I'm going to turn it over to Ario now, who is going to cover the California student aid. Hi, thank you, Amy. Um, so the governor's May revision maintains increased funding for students with dependent children and maintains the increased number of competitive Cal grants at 30,000 that were proposed in the January budget. There are some adjustments to funding levels due to revised cost estimates, but the award amount and proposals remain the same. In the slide, you can see a chart for the number of competitive Cal grants. Um, and Cal competitive Cal grants are awards to students who attend college more than one year after graduating high school. The green bar shows the number of grants currently available at 25,750 per year. And the pink bar shows the number of students who qualified for competitive Cal grants during the last school year at over 340,000. Now the May revision maintains funding the governor included in the January budget proposal that would increase the number of competitive Cal grants to 30,000 per year. But still, uh, that increase is relatively small compared to the total need um, as demonstrated in the chart. The May revision also includes 89.8 million in one-time funding to create the teacher service credit scholarship program that would offer loan forgiveness grants to teachers. Uh, this program will prioritize teachers who obtain credentials in high need subjects, such as special education and bilingual education. And it will also prioritize applicants who agreed to teach uh, in schools that have a high percentage of teachers with emergency permits. And lastly, it is important to note that the May revision does not include funding to address students' total cost of attendance such as food and housing, um, and has recently been a focus of advocates and legislatures uh, who have been pushing uh, for re to reform the state's financial aid system to account for the full uh, cost of attendance. So with that, I will hand it off to Adriana to discuss mental health and workforce development. Thank you, Ario. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go over some proposals in the governor's budget related to mental health and health workforce development. In January, the governor highlighted several emerging challenges to the mental health system, including a need to detect and treat mental illnesses as early as possible, especially in young children, a growing demand for mental health practitioners, and rising homelessness, which, as you may know, a substantial share of individuals who are homeless also struggle with mental illness. The revised budget builds on investments in mental health services made in January. Specifically, it includes a one-time investment of 20 million mental health services fund over five years for counties that currently do not operate whole person care pilot programs, which my colleague Sarah talked about a little earlier in this presentation. And again, this funding is in addition to the 100 million one-time general fund proposed in the governor's budget in January for counties that currently operate whole person care pilot programs. The mayor revision also allocates 3.6 million mental health services fund annually for three years to the Department of Healthcare Services to establish a peer run mental health crisis line, which aims to build a workforce of people living with mental illness to help guide others in need of services. The May revision also includes additional investments in the healthcare workforce in order to address increasing demand for healthcare providers. Specifically, it invests 100 million from the Mental Health Services Fund in the new Workforce Education and Training, training Five-Year Plan, which aims to address the shortage of mental health practitioners in the public mental health system. The Mayor Vision also maintains 50 million one-time general fund to increase support for existing mental health workforce programs. It includes 38.7 million Prop 56 funds to develop residency programs at hospitals throughout the state. And lastly, the Mayor Vision includes 33.3 million ongoing general fund to the Song Brown Healthcare Workforce Program, which provides, provides grants to support primary care residency training programs throughout the state. 
So I'll now hand it over to Scott to talk about health coverage and affordability, as well as proposals related to criminal and juvenile justice. Hi, thank you, Adriana. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about health first. And uh, in terms of health, I want to cover two expansions in the May revision that were carried over from the governor's January proposal with some adjustments, um, and also one really key missed opportunity that, that everyone on the webinar uh, if not in the state of California, needs to be aware of. So uh, the first expansion is the governor's proposal in terms of Medi-Cal coverage to expand eligibility uh, to low-income, undocumented um, adults between the ages of 19 and 25. So this would be the young adult population. Many of you are already aware that California provides uh, Medi-Cal full scope coverage to undocumented children and youth. That was a policy decision the legislature and governor made a few years ago. Uh, governor Newsom is proposing to uh, increase the age scale up to 25. Um, so that's a positive proposal, though I know that a lot of advocates and even members of the legislature were probably hoping that the governor would have gone even further up the age scale to bring in um, some more adults and, and ensure uh, that they have the opportunity um, to obtain full scope Medi-Cal coverage, particularly given the many contributions that immigrants make to our state. So that's likely to be something we're gonna see coming up in uh, the Assembly and Senate uh, versions, potentially, of their budgets that they're gonna be putting forward in the coming days. Um, in terms of affordability of health insurance, the governor's May revision does maintain his proposal from January to create a new state subsidy to help uh, people who have to buy their health care insurance through the individual market. In other words, they're not getting it through their employer to help them better afford um, the cost of that coverage because it's been shown um, many times that it's not, not just low income families who are struggling uh, with health care costs, um, it's also middle income families who are really feeling the pinch. So uh, the governor's May proposal um, actually would exp uh, provide these uh, state uh, subsidies to people uh, with incomes between 200% and 600% of the federal poverty line. So just to give you an example, 200% for an individual is about $25,000 a year. Um, if you're an individual at 600% of the poverty line, you're around, you've got around $75,000 a year in income. So a couple of things to keep in mind about uh, this proposal from the governor. Uh, most of the benefits of these subsidies would go to Californians in the 400% to 600% of poverty range. Um, and this is primarily because these Californians currently do not qualify for any federal subsidies uh, through the Affordable Care Act. So they are essentially on their own in terms of um, dealing with the rapidly rising health care costs, uh, premiums and otherwise uh, in our state. So most of the focus would be on those uh, mi uh, middle income households, I guess you could say. Um, and then the governor also proposes to pay for these subsidies, which would cost in the range of 300 to 400 million per year um, with revenues generated from a new state penalty on Californians who do not carry comprehensive health insurance. So that would be a new thing. The feds let the federal uh, or, or repeal, essentially repealed the federal individual mandate as it was called uh, starting this year. Uh, and essentially Governor Newsom is saying, let's replace that with a state mandate, which will not only encourage people uh, to sign up for coverage, but for those who still don't sign up, um, penalty revenues can be used to help fund uh, these new subsidies for health insurance. The one big missed opportunity uh, in the health arena relates to what is called the Managed Care Organization or MCO tax, uh, which is essentially a tax on health plans um, that allows California to leverage additional federal funds for Medi-Cal, leaves the healthcare industry no worse off financially. In fact, as a whole, they're a little better off um, and frees up over $1 billion of state general fund revenues uh, that can be used uh, to fund other important services and systems in California. So the governor has argued, he, he makes an argument, it's a little too risky at this point uh, to pursue 
uh, uh, with the federal government a request to extend this tax for a few more years. The legislative analyst's office disagrees with that assessment. Um, but the bottom line on this is if California lets the MCO tax expire, we're essentially leaving $1.5 billion on the table uh, that could otherwise um, be used to expand the capacity of our state budget to support some very important services, including uh, improving and expanding our Medi-Cal program. So I just wanna quickly switch gears here uh, and move toward criminal and juvenile justice. Uh, the governor's May revision uh, makes a statement about how uh, more transformative proposals in, this, uh, in the criminal justice arena are likely to be forthcoming over the coming year. Um, so we're pleased to hear about that and are looking forward to seeing what those proposals are gonna look like. Uh, for now, the governor's budget is you know, largely supporting the status quo within our prison system, which spending over $12 billion a year, but also making some important policy choices, including trying to provide better substance use disorder treatment um, to incarcerated adults who are struggling with alcohol and opioid addictions, um, to provide some better re-entry opportunities for uh, women who are leaving prison and getting ready to go back to their communities, and also recognizing uh, the fact that uh, our prison population is getting older and sicker. In fact, this was probably one of the saddest phrases in the governor's May revision. He pointed to a, a, a population getting older, sicker, and increasing and experiencing an increasing number of trauma-related incidents. So this is not something any of us want to hear about. California cannot be proud of this. The governor is saying uh, we need more healthcare staffing within our prison system um, as the, his proposal for solving uh, this conundrum related to an aging prison population. Uh, and then with respect to juvenile justice, the governor maintains his January proposal um, to take uh, youth correctional operations um, out of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation um, and shift them over to the state's Health and Human Services Agency uh, in an effort to provide more trauma-informed and developmentally appropriate care for justice-involved youth. Um, if the legislature approves of that proposal, this new department uh, would come into existence in July of 2020 for just, uh, just over a year from now. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I just want to touch upon a couple of other key priorities that are in uh, the governor's May revision. Uh, there wasn't a lot new to report on in terms of immigration uh, policy, but the May revision continues a set of policies that were in the January um, proposal, which includes additional funding for legal advocacy to help uh, the state's attorney general and um, others uh, combat some of the federal actions that have been uh, harmful in California. There's some new humanitarian aid for efforts on the state's southern border uh, to provide aid to community-based organizations that are helping uh, folks who are being uh, made more vulnerable by some of the federal actions. Uh, there's the Medi-Cal expansion uh, proposal that Scott just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And there's new funding for legal aid and assistance uh, for undocumented uh, students on college campuses uh, and their families. So uh, those proposals, those continue going forward. Uh, there's a couple of places, for instance, where there isn't more done, as Alyssa was mentioning earlier, like with the um, I-10 filers in the EITC expansion, uh, but those other proposals from January continue. There's also uh, a, a little bit of additional support for the state's efforts to make sure there's an accurate count for Census 2020. Uh, both Governor Brown and Governor Newsom have both put an additional $50 million into their budgets, uh, which raises the total census budget to $140 million. The May revision in Governor Newsom's budget adds another almost $4 million to aid with the outreach efforts uh, in order to ensure there's an accurate count. So there's a little bit more money for the Census 2020 as well. Uh, I just want to talk lastly a little bit about what comes next. Uh, we're in a very intense period uh, here in Sacramento now when uh, the rest of the budget policy work moves very quickly. Uh, for those of you who aren't longtime insiders on this, uh, what this means is essentially that the Senate budget process itself on the, it, their schedule is to try to wrap up the Senate version of their budget committee work uh, this week. And the assembly side is planning to wrap up their version of the budget by um, uh, mid next week. Uh, and then there'll be a little bit, a few days of a break. And um, 
the, assuming that the budgets don't completely align, which is rarely the case, there'll be a concurrent committee of the two houses budget committees that will start its work in early June uh, with the goal of wrapping up uh, a combined uh, and aligned budget to send to the governor by the deadline of midnight on June 15th. Uh, the requirement that the, that all bills, including budget bills, be in print for three days really makes that midnight of June 12th. So a lot to, is going to be happening in the next few weeks, which means if you're trying to ha have your voice heard about these issues, now is the time to be contacting your legislators, working with your coalitions to make sure your voices are heard and getting uh, the word back about what you think of the governor's proposals and the proposals that the legislature would put, will put forward in response. So we'll stop there. Uh, we've been trying to answer a few questions online as we go, but I'm sure we've got a few more that have come in along the way. Thanks, Chris. All right. So um, thanks for the rest of the team also for all their content in here. We are going to move into Q&A. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the questions box of your go-to webinar control panel or tweet us using hashtag policy perspectives. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. If we don't get to your question, remember you can always contact us via email or our website, et cetera. Um, so the first question I have here, I actually have a couple on CalWORKs. Um, so the first question is, why in what circumstances would certain members of a household would be ineligible for the CalWORKs program? Okay. Uh, this is Essie hopping on to answer that question. Um, so again, the question is, uh, why would there be, uh, under what circumstances would someone be ineligible uh, in a household uh, to receive CalWORKs passage systems? Um, and the answer is, uh, there are a few reasons. Um, uh, a family member may have sort of come up against the 48 month time limit. Uh, they may uh, currently be, be sanctioned or not uh, in keeping with the, with the work requirements. Um, a family member may be uh, perhaps receiving um, maybe SSI, uh, SSB, or um, they may be ineligible uh, due to their, their immigration status, uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, and those um, who uh, have, have been in the, the U.S. for less than, than five years are, are not eligible to receive CalWORKs cash assistance. So that th those are uh, various reasons why um, someone in the family might not be eligible for, for cash assistance. Uh, and again, that ends up coming out to uh, over half of, of uh, all CalWORKs cases. Thanks, Essie. I have another question for you. Regarding the increases to CalWORK, is, is it only for AUs of three or does that include AUs of more than three where all members of the AU are eligible? Sure, that's a, a great question to whoever it is who asked it. Um, so to be clear, and I'm sorry, if this was uh, confusing in my, my presentation. The governor's proposal um, to increase uh, grants by 13.1% by is an across the board uh, increase, uh, which means it applies, it would apply to, uh, to all households, um, whether it's an AU uh, assistance unit of, of just one to, to, to five. Um, but the point uh, I was trying to make is that it's calculated the 13.1% increase is calculated to get an assistance unit of three with only eligible members to 50% of the federal poverty line. So for everybody else, um, for example, if you are uh, in a household assistance unit of five, even where everyone is eligible, um, the increase, the 13.1% increase still only gets you to about uh, you know, 48% uh, of the federal poverty line. So you're still uh, in deep poverty. And then again, for the more than half of all CalWORKs cases um, where there is um, a family, at least one family member that's ineligible, um, ir whether it's an assistance unit size of, of three, of, of one, um, of five, uh, if there is at least one member who's ineligible, then for all of those households, um, for all those assistance unit sizes, um, then the governor's uh, proposal still leaves you um, beneath uh, the federal, the 50% of the federal poverty line still within deep poverty. Thanks, Essie. I have one more question that just came in that oh, okay. keep you, <laughs> to keep you on. Um, in the governor's investment for Black Infant Health, is that only one year or multiple years, just to clarify? Uh, I believe that's a one-time uh, investment as stated uh, right now. I don't, I don't believe that's, that's written out as a multi-year uh, uh, investment. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I'll give you a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this one I think is for Kristen. Um, will the 80.5 million Prop 64 be used to fund after school ACES program? Will how will using it for school age children slash AP slots address the child care crisis for zero to five year olds? So in the May revision, the governor is proposing to use 80.5 million in Prop 64 cannabis tax fund dollars specifically for vouchers and the alternative payment program. The May revision does not contain any dollars for ACES programs, even though they have only received one increase in funding since 2008-09. And so, um, how will this address the crisis for zero to five? This doesn't address the crisis for zero to five, but I would say per the proposition um, requirements, the dollars for Proposition 64 can be used for a variety of purposes after paying for regulatory, administrative, and research activities, one of which is youth-related drug prevention education and treatment. And so the governor is maintaining that by funding um, AP vouchers for school-age children, that they'll be deterring potential use of cannabis. Thank you, Kristen. You're welcome. All right. Um, and then, Sarah, can we get you back on? We have a couple of questions here on the homelessness and housing. Um, so uh, Marissa wanted to know if there are any updates in the January proposal to streamline the CEQA process for homeless shelters and navigation centers? Sure, so um, yes, in the January proposal, uh, the, the governor's January budget proposal um, outlined a plan to streamline um, the environmental review process for uh, homeless shelters and navigation centers. Um, there's nothing specific um, mentioned uh, about that original proposal in the May revision, but I should note that um, their streamlining of the uh, environmental review is already available to uh, certain uh, jurisdictions um, through a law that was passed last year, actually, um, that allows for um, local governments, certain local governments, specific ones laid out in the legislation that um, if they declare a, a local shelter crisis, then um, they have the authority to um, streamline uh, an, a, a lot of the review processes necessary to address that shelter crisis. Um, and there is a bill, a legislative proposal this year, AB 143, that would um, expand that list of local jurisdictions that could pursue uh, streamline approvals if they declare a shelter crisis. Um, so I will leave that at, uh, I think that's the, the response to that, that is for uh, proposals to develop shelters on land that is um, owned or leased by the local government. Thank you. And then I have another question that is, you had mentioned legal aid to renters. Does a renter find out, how do they find out about that at their local level? Sure. Well, first, uh, just to clarify, so this, we're talking about the, the governor's proposed budget. So we don't know if any of these, we'll have to wait and see which of these specific items end up in the final budget that's approved. Um, and, you know, that uh, the final budget that is uh, passed by the legislature and signed by the governor may or may not include any of these proposals. So um, if, the, if that $20 million um, allocation for legal aid for renters to help them just resolve uh, tenant landlord disputes, if that piece um, ends up being incorporated into the final budget, um, it will then take a little bit of time for, for those dollars to go out the door. Um, but the proposal for how those would be spent is that they would be distributed to nonprofit um, legal aid providers. So for a renter to find out about the services that would be funded through that, um, they would want to go to their local nonprofit legal aid provider um, and um, those are the organizations that would be able to receive funding from this allocation in order to, to support those legal services. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, I know that we're past 12 o'clock, so we're going to try to get through the last couple questions here um, really quickly. Scott, if you can hop back on, um, there's a question that you had mentioned, subsidized medical coverage for middle-income Californians. What was the name of that program? Um, well, this would be, it, it doesn't have an official name. Um, it's just the governor's proposal to create new state subsidies to help uh, people in that income range, 400 to 600% of poverty, um, better afford health coverage that they purchase on the individual market. So I haven't, I don't know, it might have a name. I haven't actually seen an official name for that. So um, yeah, okay. so that's 
hopefully that works as an answer. <laughs> um, the other question I have here for you is, is the $5 million still going to help the California Commission to enact a study on single payer finance system? It was in a finance letter, so it's Randy. That is an issue that I, I know that there are people out in the world who can answer that question. Unfortunately, I am not one of them, but I have been meaning to look into this question because there's been some kind of debate going on surrounding uh, this commission, which was originally set up by the legislature with a slightly different purpose. It wasn't going to have a single payer focus. It was going to talk about how California could get to a system of unified financing of health care, which some people may argue is just splitting hairs. Um, but it, it appears that there is an effort um, by the Newsom administration to shift the focus of the commission more in the direction of a single payer development plan. So, um, but that is an area I need to look into and have not had an opportunity to do so yet. So whoever asked that question, please follow up with me via email and I will get back to you if I learn more. Thanks. And Scott, I have one more question and it's more of okay. a subjective one. Do you have any hints or reasons why you think that the governor or what would it take for the governor to increase the SSI SSP grants? why the governor is not proposing to increase SSI, SSP grants? Yep. Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't answer. I really, honestly, I have no idea. You know, the stock answer is budgets are about setting priorities. Um, funding is limited in any given year. Um, although we have a 20, almost $21 billion budget surplus this year, um, the governor and his finance staff are wary of the future revenue performance. It's not just about the recession that could be lurking around the corner. It's also just generally about how revenues may perform in the next two, three, or four years, even if we even if we don't go into a recession. So I think it's simply without, you know, without trying to, to make it a negative statement, it is just simply an indication uh, that similar to Governor Brown's administration, um, the Newsom administration, for whatever reason, uh, does not think that it's important to boost the state's level of basic income assistance going to uh, low-income seniors and people with disabilities. So you can read whatever you want into that. I am just trying to make a neutral statement here, but if budgets are about values and priorities, the things that you do not prioritize are not in your budget, and then it's up to advocates to go to the administration and try to find out why. And of course, the other avenue is to go to the legislature and see if they may consider adding it into the budgets that they are developing um, over the next several days. Um, Scott, on that, um, a question came up that the governor had pledged to make a master plan on aging. Were there any funds proposed for funding that task force to create the plan, or do you know? I, yeah, um, I am sorry, I'm lacking specific information on this one. I know that's one that's been out there. I believe there is something. I don't know if money is attached to it. So I apologize for not being able to answer that question here. Um, but again, if the person who asked the question wants to follow up with me directly, I'm, I'm happy uh, to seek an answer and let them know what it is. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, and with that, we have taken up most of your time. So, um, as we do not get to the many questions that did come in, remember that you can always contact us. Here's our contact information, phone number, and contact at calbudgetcenter.org is the email to send us to, and we will direct you to the right person. Again, um, thank you all for tuning in today. This program would not have been as successful without all of you, and as well as our sponsors, First Five LA and the Stupski Foundation. Thank you again for tuning into the speaker series. Have a great day.